all beautiful people of Africa and the world at large. It's another exciting moment for us to be together on the platform Global Inside on For You Media Africa, the Pan African Television. Today we revisit a very important, uh, a very important topic, looking at global uh, leadership and uh, election, and asking uh, the question to determine what real uh, legitimacy is. It should be noted that in line with the 2024 global rating on world leaders, some top politicians like the leadership of USA, Joe Biden, Francis Emmanuel Macron, and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz have reached a record low. As per the rating, Macron uh, scored 22% approval and a 71% disapproval for Biden. He came 39% of approval with a 53% disapproval. The German Chancellor Olaf Scholz uh, secured 24% approval and 70% uh, disappro uh, disapproval. So today's show with a team of experts dives into the complex topic of leadership and elections globally. Also, to the, the, the program today seeks to understand the concept of real legitimacy in politics. And of course, we look at indicators of legitimacy and what it truly means for leaders to command the support of their people as we examine current writings of top politicians. And a case study this day is the US President uh, Joe Biden, uh, Francis Macron, and of course, uh, the uh, German uh, Chancellor. It is on this note that we unveil today's edition of uh, Global inside and I want to thank you gentlemen and ladies for taking this rendezvous we go straight away uh, to uncovering uh, the uh, panel of course uh, today that will uh, give highlights or greater insight on today's uh, topic uh, answering the question of what real legitimacy is and of course what makes leaders to secure a very low approval rating in 2024 it should be noted that uh, these uh, top politicians we just highlighted in a preamble uh, we are actually uh, having a lot of confidence uh, from their respective uh, citizens uh, that should be uh, according to a 2022 uh, uh, global rating, but uh, the story is different in 2024. What are those indicators or what are those factors which have actually meet, uh, made uh, these uh, leaders to actually uh, go down in the uh, global uh, rating for some prominent politicians across the global world? And now I'll be taking you straight away to the United States of America uh, in Tennessee. We are going to join uh, Steve uh, Gill, who is a political commentator, also a radio host. Hello to you, Steve, and thanks for joining us this day. Hey, Clarice, it's good to see you again. It's always a pleasure having you. Looking forward to having a fruitful, constructive uh, uh, d uh, discussion uh, with you, uh, dear Steve. And uh, to the uh, uh, Spain, we are being jo joined uh, by uh, Enrique Rifeo, who is a journalist and uh, who doubles as a political uh, analyst. Hello to you, uh, Enrique, and thanks for joining us, I think, for the first time on this platform and uh, for you, Media Africa. Hello to you all. Nice to see you here, and uh, I'm very glad to be here with all of you. Looking forward to having a fruitful uh, discussion uh, with you, dear Enrique. Just to note that uh, Yulia Burke will be joining us in about 10 minutes to continue. Uh, join us in uh, this uh, very important uh, discussion uh, without uh, wasting more time. I will kick off with you, uh, uh, Steve. Uh, today we are looking at global leadership and elections, and our focus is on what the stakes of uh, real legislation uh, legitimacy as far as uh, this uh, uh, global rating 
is concerned on these uh, uh, top politicians across the global world. And uh, of course, we always want to have a holistic approach to the uh, topic. Uh, in your own perspective, what can you uh, make of these uh, uh, ratings that were released uh, this month, uh, this year, I beg your pardon, and of course, uh, seeing uh, that the leadership of uh, uh, the United States of America, along likes like uh, Macron and uh, the Chancellor of, of Germany, have recorded uh, low approval rates, especially uh, from uh, their own uh, uh, respective countries. What can we make of this? Well, I think that uh, ultimately uh, reality uh, trumps rhetoric. And a lot of these politicians talk good, but at the end of the day, the, the people who are dealing with inflation, who are dealing with challenges in their communities in terms of crime and violence, uh, uh, the, the lack, uh, certainly in the United States, of, of President Biden to deal with inflation, to deal with uh, the, the high cost of products, whether it's fuel or whether it's food. Uh, he may claim that Bidenomics is working, that his economic uh, powers are great, but people feel the truth when they go to the grocery store, when they go to the gasoline pump and, and fill their car. So ultimately, his rhetoric that Bidenomics is working is not as important as what people are actually experiencing. And I think that's true in, in France and Germany and these other countries. Ultimately, reality uh, is more powerful than, than rhetoric and what politicians say. I think the other thing is that uh, in terms of leadership, and, and you know, obviously we look all over the world, I'm, I'm more attuned to what's going on here in, in this country, in the United States. But when you, when you look at the elections that are taking place around the world, the United States has, has uh, bullied its way through international and foreign policy for a long time, uh, trying to force their leaders into power in countries, whether the people there wanted them or not. And as long as there are fair and transparent elections, if the people of Slovakia want to elect somebody who may not be as in tune with U.S. interests as with their own interests, if, if uh, uh, you know, there is a president in Russia who gets 87 percent of the votes in his country and uh, Clarice, you and I were there seeing the election process, the transparency, the openness, the way it gets reported in the West is frankly completely untrue. But if the people of Russia want Putin, then the people of Russia should have their president. If, if uh, America is blind enough to reelect Joe Biden, I'm sorry for the rest of the world, but that's our poor choice that we foist upon you. I don't think that's going to happen. But it is past time for the United States to keep trying to put their thumb on politics in other countries, whether it's trying to force out Benjamin Netanyahu, whether it's uh, not um, having approval of, of Maduro in Venezuela. Yeah. As long as the elections are fair and transparent or reasonably fair, you know, maybe even as good as here in the United States or better, then we have no right to say this is who your leader should be. We should deal with the leaders they elect and, and not try to bully our way into their internal politics, but instead let them have their say if, in fact, we support democracy. And, and again, I would just also point out that in Ukraine, where we keep waving the flag of Ukraine, claiming this is the democracy we must defend and fund with U.S. tax dollars, President Zelensky has canceled elections. He only has one more month till his term ends. After that time, he is holding power illegally. He's canceled elections. He's canceled opposition media. He's canceled opposition political parties. He's he's going after religious institutions like the Russian Orthodox Church that he disagrees with. That That is not leadership that the U.S. should be embracing, encouraging, and funding. And yet, we, we claim we're for democracy when we see the most undemocratic leaders in the world holding on to power thanks to our money, thanks to our military resources, and, and in many cases, the, the false media that we put out there. That's not right. And, and it's time for America and our American leadership to grow up and, and get back to doing the right thing. Indeed, it's about doing the right thing. Uh, listening to uh, some reports, uh, it notes it that uh, Biden actually that was uh, supported, highly supported by young voters in the last election uh, in the United States. Actually, these uh, young voters have a contrary view as to if they will uh, elect uh, Biden in the November slated uh, election. And uh, that's uh, another bond of contention. Uh, and of course, uh, Steve, you mentioned 
of course, the rhetoric uh, that uh, come with uh, electoral promises and how politicians actually uh, maybe undermine uh, these uh, promises and uh, sometimes derail from the domestic needs of uh, uh, the, the country towards uh, uh, international aspects, of course, uh, giving more importance to foreign affairs uh, aspects, which sometimes are detrimental to the uh, growth of the nation. In the same perspective uh, with you, Enrique, we are looking at uh, the uh, real uh, stakes or meaning of legitimacy as far as uh, global leadership is concerned and even elections. Uh, I would love to understand from you what uh, the uh, major indicators of uh, legitimacy are and how these uh, indicators affect the rating of top politicians across the globe. Well, uh, I can give you a very hot example from Spain because we had uh, some strange moment in which our president took uh, holidays for five days. He wanted to take a rest and uh, thinking if he continues in the power or he uh, uh, dismisses. But of course, we knew that uh, he will continue. The most important is not that. The most important is the final speech that he did after uh, these five days. He talked to the people in the uh, state uh, television that uh, he wants to control the media. He wants to control the things are said, not only in the official media, in the official televisions, uh, radio, but also in internet. He joined it, uh, to the European Union campaign against uh, misinformation and disinformation. This is very important because this marks all the, uh, the, the whole of the course in this year. In January, in the World Economic Forum in Davos and later in the, in the very European Union in the mouth of uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, both of them told about the fighting against uh, misinformation and disinformation, of course, uh, targeting against Russia because Russia or China uh, inclusive are terrible countries that can middle in, in the European elections, in Western elections, and so on and so on. So we have uh, the bad character of the film, like the life is a film. Okay, we have the bad ones, Russia, China. We have the good ones, European Union, yeah. the Western, the collective uh, Western countries. And we have the missing, fighting against disinformation. So, this was presented, introduced to the people as, uh, as a film. But uh, the people is saying, why we cannot talk about the reality? Why we have to be censored by the power? But journalists is not the control of the power. It's not making the correct answers, the proper answers to the power. No, now the journalism is the... Um, applause the company of the power. That's the way they are looking from uh, European Union. And of course, if uh, something is uh, decided in European Union, the European countries, the European members have to uh, translate into their own uh, laws. OK, and now uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, documents from the European Union talking about, uh, for example, uh, Russian elections are not uh, legitimate. Of course, later in, uh, in July, it will be elections, uh, presidential elections in Venezuela. And they are also uh, warming the scenario about uh, elections in Venezuela are not legitimate, in uh, Russia are not legitimate. Of course, if uh, Western uh, countries don't have their own candidate in the power, then it's not uh, legitimate. And I am thinking, for example, in Poland, uh, Poland had uh, elections in uh, September 2023, and uh, suddenly it won the candidate of establishment, of uh, globalist establishment. It won um, Donald Tusk. And uh, suddenly Ursula von der Leyen gave the best words, the warmest words 
uh, to him like, oh, what a wonderful day we have you again in the power and so on and so on. And it doesn't matter the things are making the government of uh, Donald Tusk in Poland. Now they have their own candidate, their own people in Poland. And now in Poland is uh, increasing the speech uh, from power about the deployment of uh, nuclear weapons in, in Poland. Okay, of course, uh, not uh, Poland, Polish uh, nuclear weapons, but uh, American uh, from USA uh, nuclear weapons and uh, making uh, like uh, a dooming campaign about uh, we have to be at war with Russia in uh, one or two years, so we have to be prepared. And uh, if uh, this will be made by a right nationalist uh, patriotic party, mm -hmm. it will be a political crisis in Europe, like uh, fascism is rising in Poland, but now they are making from a good country, because it is in, under good hands of uh, a globalist. So everything what is happening in Poland, okay. In Romania, exactly the same. So uh, in conclusion, they are telling again that uh, if uh, the, our candidate, our guy is in the power, okay, everything is legitimate. Yeah. If not, everything is not legitimate and we have to attack this country until we get our guy in the power. Thank you so much, of course, uh, for the uh, uh, deep uh, insider. Uh, Julia Berg just uh, joined us now. Hello to you, Julia Berg. You're joining in your capacity as a political scientist and founder of Global's Expert uh, Club. And welcome to today's edition of Global Insight. I think we're going to continue with you, uh, Steve, uh, while waiting for Yulia to uh, to rejoin. Uh, we, we, while talking, uh, you highlighted some of uh, the uh, uh, crises uh, affecting uh, the U.S. Uh, on the, the uh, Biden administration. And we can also see how some uh, uh, voters uh, of the viewpoint that if they have to vote Biden in the uh, 2024 elections, there will be indirectly uh, supporting uh, the military uh, intervention in Israel and I uh, said that cannot uh, be done uh, consciously so the, the question is uh, how do you think uh, the Biden administration can uh, maybe uh, go through these uh, challenges and address them uh, before the nation heads into uh, its uh, historic uh, historic uh, presidential elections uh, that we, we see hit it already uh, uh, between uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden? Well, well first of all, let me say that uh, Enrique mm -hmm. hit so many of the right points. Uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid that whoever the speechwriter is for the president of Spain must be writing Joe Biden's speeches because he's saying the same thing, telling journalists, you need to report positively about me. You need to tell my story. Uh, and and they've, they've put pressure on journalists to, to do that. Uh, President Biden reads from his little card when he rarely does a press conference to call on specific media that he's already prepared and has written notes to answer the question he knows is coming. So, so the media in, in the United States, obviously in Spain and around the world, has been completely co-opted by these leaders who are asking the questions that the politician wants to be asked, getting the answer that the politician is prepared for, and then they report it just like these bobblehead dolls without having any skepticism, any journalistic integrity to say that that's not true. Uh, and with Joe Biden, we see it happening all the time and, and obviously in other countries as well. Enrique also mentioned that uh, these elections like in Russia or in Venezuela or anywhere else where the US and Western uh, countries do not get the person they want are declared to be sham elections, fake elections. Uh, and, and yet, uh, you know, again, uh, Clarice, we were there in uh, in September in, in uh, Donbass. We were there in Moscow for the presidential elections last month or a month ago. Uh, I didn't see CNN. I didn't see MSNBC, ABC, the New York Times, the Washington Post. They report these stories without having anybody there who can actually tell the truth about what's going on. And, and you know, we see uh, military uh, coverage of the Ukraine side of the conflict 
there aren't any reporters embedded on the on the Russian side of that telling the rest of the story when you see bakeries being hit with missiles in, in Donetsk, uh, 28 or 30 people killed at a bakery. That doesn't get reported by Western media because they, they don't embed reporters there. During the Iraq war uh, in 2004 and again in 2005, I embedded with U.S. troops. I was on the ground able to say, this is what I'm seeing, this is what I'm experiencing, not hiding in some hotel, by the way, in Baghdad, but actually out with the troops, seeing what was going on and, yeah. and doing live reports of, of what was happening. We are not seeing that, certainly on the Russian side in this Ukraine conflict, and yet they will post reporters with the Hamas terrorists in Gaza. They'll be telling their story. They'll be reporting the, the death toll in Gaza with whatever Hamas tells them without, again, any skepticism, any questioning. So the media is completely uh, lost their credibility, I think. And, and, and unfortunately, that means in this kind of global political arena, people only know what they know. So whether it's in Spain, whether it's in England, whether it's in the United States, if we only hear one side of the story, then the American people will vote based upon lies, misinformation, and, and the lack of real truth. And I think that's a danger to democracy everywhere. And that's what we're seeing you know, play out time and time and time again. The, the, the fundamental uh, balance of democracy is that you have an informed and engaged population. Well, if they're misinformed, either they're not going to be engaged, they're not going to go vote, or they're going to vote based upon lies and misinformation. And, and we are seeing that, unfortunately, I think, all over the world. And, and if that's very uh, problematic. Uh, uh, coming back uh, swiftly to you, uh, Enrique, uh, while talking earlier on, uh, you accentuated uh, on uh, the uh, the fact that uh, the uh, leadership of Spain actually dictates what the uh, uh, the media should report as far as uh, the uh, news uh, uh, reporting is concerned. You know, uh, the title of May is uh, the World Press uh, uh, Freedom Day, and today we are looking at uh, the uh, the main of legitimacy and looking at some of the indicators uh, which I think uh, freedom of the press and of course freedom of expression is uh, one of those uh, indicators of legitimacy that can also uh, give uh, a prominence to political uh, leaders. So this brings us to uh, the, the, the question uh, uh, regarding how uh, these uh, uh, leaders that have been very involved in on international or global uh, issues pertaining particularly uh, uh, the uh, uh, events uh, happening in Russia, the last uh, presidential elections uh, that uh, most of these countries uh, uh, tempt the elections a sham, like Steve said, without sending uh, reporters on the field. And uh, today we are looking at these uh, politicians who, who are seemingly, or uh, according to them, uh, making waves, but now it, this is uh, negatively affecting their uh, credibility conversant uh, with all of these maneuvers that happen to even hijack the media. What do you think are the right uh, thing, uh, or maybe the right thing to do by the uh, media journalists and, of course, uh, other opinion uh, uh, leaders to ensure uh, that this uh, uh, propaganda that is circulating across the global world, which is give, uh, making it more uh, susceptible to to conflicts and of course uh, uh, military uh, crises and of course what are the, the the right parameters to be used by the media organ to counter this uh, propaganda and bring resolve to some of the problems the world is facing at this particular moment well there are two previous moments uh, to understand what is happening now uh, first moment, 40 years ago, when the lockdowns, when, when the COVID, and uh, the politicians were trying to push in a concrete agenda to the people, a concrete situation. You have to be under lockdown because blah, 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 the reasons from the power. And nobody could uh, uh, argue this. It was the official vision, nothing more, nothing less. You have to follow the rules. You have to keep calm and be under the government. In uh, 2022, it started uh, the special military operation of Russia in Ukraine, in Western countries, the war in Ukraine, and it happened exactly the same. 
you have to think under the pyramids or the, under the the, uh, the the concrete space from the power. So if you are in Western country and the power uh, says you that uh, this is a terrible aggression of Russia against the democratic Ukraine, you have to follow the official command and nothing more. You are a Russian agent or a foreign agent if you don't uh, follow exactly this uh, man mandate uh, from the from the power to the people. And now, uh, to, in 2024, we have uh, the promise from the uh, Western establishment that, that we have a global war and a new um, epidemic. It, the X uh, illness. So it, it was absolutely strange and stupid from the power from uh, this uh, January. And uh, what happened after uh, in in the back part of it? It's a terrible uh, situation. It's an emergency situation. So unpopular mm -hmm. measures have to be taken from the power. So they know that people uh, will be under rebellion if uh, these unpopular measures have no reason, are groundless. So they try to control the media space for controlling the situation. So if people cannot uh, think outside of the, uh, med of the official version, so if there are not other versions, if uh, people cannot think uh, freely, okay, uh, the, this unpopular measures, actions, this agenda, terrible agenda, uh, indeed, there, there won't have any opposition. And that's the key point, to eliminate the opposition, the inner opposition in Western countries. Uh, and in all uh, in North America, in Europe, it's the same agenda. And uh, it's absolutely terrible because at the same time, uh, for example, in my case from European Union, uh, the leader, the leaderships are trying to push their own agenda and their own vision to other countries like Russia, China, African countries, uh, South American countries. And it's like, but uh, you, you are trying to eliminate your inner opposition and you are trying to impart uh, lessons to other countries about not to um, eliminate inner opposition or this is the allegation from Brussels. So it's like the, the double measure uh, in the power. It's, it's absolutely incredible how, how they can uh, lie to the people, to their own people, to the peoples of the world, and there is no embarrassment. It's uh, amazing. I am absolutely amazed of, uh, of it because it's like uh, under which type of elite we are. They can lie to their own people, to the peoples of the world. It's absolutely terrible. And uh, for example, and I finish with it, uh, Mr. Joseph Borrell, the uh, leader of the European diplomacy, for example, when they talk about uh, Global South, he is absolutely lost <laughs> in, in the middle of nothing, because he, are, he is trying to, to talk about uh, with uh, assertivity, like, yes, we, we understand you, we are with you, and, but suddenly, no, you have to be with us, and that's an order. And uh, suddenly African countries decide to turn to uh, Russia, to Africa, and suddenly in the European news, oh, Russia is taking control over Africa, over South America, and so on and so on. But they cannot make uh, autocritics uh, from it. They, they think that they are perfect, and uh, if uh, the result is not perfect, <coughs> It must be a med uh, meddling from uh, from the enemy, and the enemies, of course, in this case, are Russia and China. Yeah. So it's absolutely stupid how they are destroying. In in the case uh, where I live in in Europe, they are destroying Europe. They are trying to push a dictatorship, but it's like uh, the um, purple, the pink dictatorship. 
it uh, doesn't look like a dictatorship, but it's really a dictatorship. If you don't think like Indeed. the system, like the establishment wants, you are out of the system. And um, of okay. course, uh, the the, <laughs> uh, the political rhetoric that sometimes uh, uh, put uh, people uh, in a, a, a state of uh, confusion. And uh, while listening, of course, uh, to you, uh, Enrique, I will welcome uh, Yulia Berg and uh, continue with this uh, uh, statement. Uh, we are looking at uh, the, the ratings uh, which have come uh, the year 2024, like uh, we underlined already, and we see that. That, uh, these uh, politicians which we are focused on today we are actually uh, having a high uh, vote of confidence in 2022 but now when you come to 2024 the uh, story is different and I, I think uh, it's because uh, of uh, the, the realities uh, that uh, the world has understood and uh, the, the major role that the media and other uh, peace lovers or peace advocates or opinion uh, leaders have been playing to ensure uh, that uh, the uh, uh, bring forth narratives uh, that uh, stand in line with uh, the actual situation that the global world is uh, facing now. We welcome you, Lieberg. Now, in, in the context of international uh, relations, how do you or how do low uh, approval ratings of leaders uh, such as uh, Biden or uh, Macron and, of course, the Gen uh, German Chancellor impact their relations with other uh, world powers and uh, uh, global alliances and what actually are the stakes involved? Well, I think the topic that we're discussing today is extremely important because when we talk about global uh, leadership and elections, unfortunately, these two in uh, the countries that uh, call themselves the, uh, the, the perfect democracies and try to set example for everyone else have discredited both institutions, which is leadership and elections, right? When we look at the electoral system, for example, in the United States that see or perceive their mission or one of their missions to promote democracy globally, they do not even have direct elections of the leaders. There are only two political parties and the small political parties have zero chances to have their candidates um, running for presidency and uh, having a real chance to make it, right? Yeah. So it's over-controlled, and uh, the, the party system itself has also discredited itself uh, quite a lot because the ideological or uh, even value uh, basis that they used to have is just non-existent, and you don't have anything to choose from. For example, you tended to be um, a liberal, uh, quite so, but what the Democratic Party is uh, promoting now at some points can be called satanic. I mean, it's anti-humane to a great extent, especially you know, various kinds of uh, promotion of uh, uh, gender change for children and teenagers and everything else. And if you are, let's say, a liberal, but you don't go uh, as far as, uh, you know, messing with uh, uh, gender issues at the biological level, you have no representative that could possibly that could possibly talk about your uh, actual interests and represent you uh, in Senate or in, in in the Parliament or let's say uh, um, as the president. So the um, institution uh, and the uh, procedural aspects of elections, for example, in the United States, are uh, not really transparent, and you don't see. Uh, too many foreign observers, access for foreign observers is uh, restricted, right? So it's hard even to tell what exactly is happening at the polling stations. And we've seen the scandal uh, with Trump and Biden, where just simple stats and maths uh, show that it was not uh, realistic for uh, Biden to win at certain uh, polling stations or even in certain states. So what's happening in France at the moment with Macron, uh, whose uh, support rating is as low as 30 percent, is pretty much the same thing, because it's really hard to say that Macron is representing interests of the majority. And democracy, yeah. as the rule of the people, is supposed to be the rule of majority. While Absolutely, now yeah. we see the rule of quite radical groups that promote uh, that promote policies and values that are anti-traditional, which implies that they cannot be supported by the majority. And the polls reflect this leadership crisis and crisis of uh, 
uh, electoral procedures in the Western countries that uh, that were supposed to be or were supposed were presenting themselves as perfect democracy. So uh, that's a, that's a big problem. And uh, when we come back to what was on the news just recently that uh, the European authorities claim that the Russian election was illegitimate and Putin uh, is in power illegitimately. This is ridiculous because when you look at the polls, you see that uh, Vladimir Putin uh, is enjoying uh, support he has never enjoyed before. And of course, even applying simple logic would tell you that uh, the middle of the war is not exactly a point where when you change leadership. So, of course, the, the vast majority of the population doesn't want any changes at the moment. Uh, the president is trusted uh, and uh, people showed their support on the voting day and they show their support on a daily basis in, uh, in uh, various uh, forms and, and shapes, right? So the uh, leadership crisis implies that you don't need to have leadership skills, which is being a role model, setting an example, walking the talk, being a strong leader, uh, following the value system that, uh, that you claim you intend to follow and everything else. You don't even need to be intelligent enough. And we see quite a lot of examples, unfortunately, of uh, leaders so-called and politicians, uh, starting from Annalena Baerbock to many others, that, um, that uh, oftentimes say things that a person with a higher education should not even say. I mean, not, not even understanding what 360 degrees is, is uh, uh, quite critical. I mean, this is something studied at school. And uh, this is a very sad fact, but uh, what is even more frustrating is that uh, uh, that system produces uh, this kind of statements that discredit leadership, not just in Russia, yeah. but also we've seen how they deal with the leaders in African countries. And it's easy, you know, if we don't like you, we just take you down either by a coup d'etat or we just come in and kill you and they then laugh at it like Hillary Clinton did, right? So um, it's a big issue, and um, nowadays, given the development of technology, probably the electoral processes would be changing a lot, getting more digital, and uh, the, the fact that leadership itself has discredited uh, the concept of being a leader, I think we will see uh, that uh, the approaches to that would also be changing, because people are definitely not stupid. And people, when even when they watch the news that are being fabricated for them, or when they watch local pro propaganda, regardless of where they are, people are not stupid. They still understand what is true, what is fake, what is weak, and what is strong. Which is a very imperative. Uh, let me stay uh, with you, uh, yeah, Yulia. You, you actually highlighted a very important uh, points, focusing on uh, leadership uh, elections and uh, bringing uh, some uh, peculiarities of uh, this term. Now let's uh, try to to answer this question of what a real uh, uh, legitimacy is uh, in uh, the uh, uh, light of uh, democracy, uh, given uh, the uh, the political upheavals in uh, the uh, said uh, countries. You know, you pointed out the last election where we saw uh, Donald Trump contesting uh, the last uh, presidential elections in the U.S., uh, something which uh, some people actually uh, uh, got that for the first time, and it was actually uh, worrisome. You underlined uh, the, uh, the, 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 this, the closure of uh, uh, international observers. Uh, now, the, the question is, how do we contextualize uh, democracy, and how can this actually uh, help, uh, let's say, uh, the, uh, the European uh, Council and other organizations that mm -hmm. till date are still uh, define uh, the past elections or uh, the last elections in Russia as a sham and actually uh, filing to discredit it. How can we contextualize the definition of democracy as a way towards for uh, solving some of these uh, uh, post elections or even uh, political crises that the countries are facing at a particular moment? Well, the issue of legitimacy has also been uh, quite discredited. And I mean, even when you look at the uh, democratic systems, 
it is supposed to be the uh, the power of people so the power of the majority but when you look at the actual numbers and stats from some of the elections <laughs> let's say you had 40 percent of voter turnout which means that 40 percent of eligible voters actually made it to the polling stations and uh, let's say if half of them voted for some candidate a that would mean that only 20 percent of the uh, population or 20 percent of the people who had the right to vote meaning adults um, they actually support that person in power so 20 percent is definitely not the majority but it still works and it's still considered legitimacy because the ones not making it to the polling stations are and their opinion automatically is uh, excluded from representation right and from being represented so we can say that it's their decision, but still no democracy is a real, uh, let's say, uh, power of uh, majority. At the same time, uh, when we talk about uh, legitimacy in general terms, it means that uh, the procedures are followed and the procedures, uh, the procedures allow for a certain candidate to be elected. But here as well, a lot of issues arise because at the uh, at the modern day map of the world, there are many countries that uh, that uh, didn't exist even like 30, 40 years ago or 50 years ago. So it's a brand new legislation that is subject to change pretty much during each uh, electoral cycle. So sometimes what gets changed is terms. It could be four years or six years or seven years for which uh, certain uh, uh, institutions or candidates are being elected. Uh, at the same time, you have quite a lot of uh, reforms in terms of constitutions, and that changes a lot. And I mean, we had those changes in um, in Russia, we had that in Turkey, we had that in many countries. But one of the examples that um, that is very striking in my understanding is that uh, when you look at, for example, um, Angela Merkel, who was in power for almost 20 years, a bit less than that, if I'm not mistaken, but there was no issue with her being in power for 20 years. And at the same time, uh, Recep Erdogan in Turkey and uh, Vladimir Putin were in power for pretty much the same amount of time. And that was a problem for the West. That was a problem for uh, the states. And they were saying that it's too long and too much and whatsoever else. But no one had an issue with Angela Merkel. She was just doing her thing. And that was fine. So we can see that the approach to uh, legitimacy as a concept, well, number one, there is no universal definition for that. Okay. Number two, political <laughs> systems and regimes keep changing as new states arise, as, uh, you know, constitutional reforms are being conducted. And number three is that uh, this concept itself is being applied in a very flexible manner, meaning that uh, for the Western countries, if they like someone, uh, he or she is legitimate. If they don't like someone, then he or she is not. So um, this as well, I suppose, should be discussed at the international uh, level, maybe at the uh, at the existing platforms like the UN uh, or some other international organizations. But this uh, process itself requires uh, uh, a fresh approach. And as far as I know, there are discussions ongoing at the moment regarding um, creating alternative organizations that would deal with electoral processes and observation and all of those issues in order to have an alternative approach based on standards and criteria and data that can be fact-checked rather than just opinions from across the pond. Of course, uh, which is uh, very uh, imperative uh, in the quest uh, to creating uh, a new world order. It is imperative also to look at uh, the uh, institutions uh, that will uh, make an effort uh, to uh, being actually uh, uh, categorical in solving uh, and uh, to, to, to move from this aspect like you just underlined, uh, like if you are being loved by this country, it means uh, you are legitimate. Uh, now, uh, coming back to you, uh, Steve, uh, we are looking at uh, some of these uh, rhetorics along the lines of uh, politics. And now let's come back uh, to uh, to foreign policy. You bear with me uh, that uh, according to, to, to latest or uh, recent news, uh, Joe Biden happens to be uh, uh, one of the, the least 
popular uh, president uh, in the history of uh, the leadership of the United States of America. And uh, in its foreign policy, it's largely seen, I can say, uh, that uh, Biden actually uh, focuses more on uh, war rather than uh, uh, the economy. We are taking an, uh, an example of uh, the recent decision uh, to send billions of US dollars uh, to Ukraine and also uh, to the Middle East, particularly to Israel, uh, to, to support uh, the uh, uh, leadership of Ukraine, uh, uh, Zelensky, and of course, Israeli uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, what can I explain? Uh, can we say that these are some of the, uh, the, the reasons or the strong points which have uh, uh, led to the declining confidence in uh, the leadership of uh, Biden? And uh, how can uh, uh, the, maybe uh, how are the, the United States citizens uh, reacting to some of these uh, uh, decisions uh, voted by the U.S. Congress pertaining uh, uh, the supply of ammunition to countries at war? Well, first of all, I don't think uh, many people in the United States, as the polls show, have any confidence in uh, in Joe Biden either as a domestic policy leader or as a foreign policy leader. Nor, nor to leaders around the globe. Uh, uh, Anthony Blinken, our Secretary of State, just visited China, and, and the Chinese government didn't meet him at the airport and, and didn't send him off when he left. I mean, it was a, a very direct and, and strong signal that they didn't care what he had to say. Uh, China is building coal power plants uh, and opening a new one about each month, while the U.S. is shuttering our own energy independence. China is building theirs up. Uh, Blinken was there to threaten China that if they kept, uh, you know, operating financially with Russia, that we would we would respond. And clearly, China is not afraid of that. Uh, the U.S. under Blinken is also threatening India that if they continue to buy oil from Russia, that we may impose sanctions on them. It seems that the Biden administration is trying to pick a fight with literally every country around the globe. And uh, man, if I'm if I'm one of those Caribbean countries in in the Bahamas in uh, Aruba or Jamaica, man, I'm worried because that's a close attack that, uh, that the uh, Biden administration could launch as they're looking for another war. Enrique made a great point that, that the media is not holding these folks accountable, and, and nobody's holding the media uh, that are mere propagandists anymore accountable as well. Yeah. During COVID, we were constantly told the lies that, oh, if you'll take the vax, you won't get sick and you won't die. Turned out that was not true. I, I don't know what they did around the rest of the world, but in the U.S., we have this imposition of this six-foot stand-apart business that, that now they acknowledge, okay, there wasn't any basis on that. They pretty much just picked that number out of the air. Everything they told us about COVID, it turns out, was a lie, including some of the medicines like ivermectin that they were uh, either threatening doctors who prescribed it or trying to shut it down, calling it horse medicine when they now acknowledge it was one of the most effective treatments to deal with COVID. Uh, during the years of COVID here in the United States, the CDC reported zero cases of flu deaths for like three years. Not a single flu death, when typically there's gonna be 70,000 to 100,000, there were zero. They counted everything as COVID deaths to continue the propaganda that you must. As Enrique said, do what the government says, wear your mask, get your, get your vaccine. And now they acknowledge none of that was true and that Anthony Fauci was involved in creating this COVID um, disaster uh, with U.S. tax dollars. And so the truth comes out after and, and they try to deny that they told uh, anybody to take the vaccine, you won't get sick, you won't die, take the boosters. And now we're seeing people die of heart problems because of the vax and they're still denying it. But as Enrique pointed out, you got to follow the money. There were advertisements on our TV stations and our news networks saying, you gotta take the backs, you gotta do this, because they were getting paid to tell us lies. We're seeing the same thing when it comes to the military industrial complex, where the, uh, the, the Washington DC based Sunday morning talk shows, they have ads from, from, from these uh, military companies, you know, F-16s and other fighter jets, it's not because somebody watching the TV show is going to go order a, an F-35 or F-16. They're wanting to communicate to members of Congress that they have the money, they have the voice, and you better toe the line and do what we say. Uh, it's interesting. I, I went back and looked at the media coverage 
of the Crimean elections uh, 10 years ago, NPR, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, ABC, NBC, CBS, they had reporters there reporting from the ground the Crimean elections that, uh, that now they want to decry as fraud and that, that Crimea was taken in, inappropriately, the same way that they are decrying the elections in, in Donbass in September um, when I was there, when Faris was there, when Yulia was there. They're saying, oh, they were sham elections. But there was nobody from any of the Western media, either in Europe or from the U.S., that was there, well, except for me. And yet they're reporting like they were there and that they're telling the truth. They didn't see it. The same thing with the presidential elections in, uh, in uh, March. There weren't any reporters there. I did a live report from a polling station on GB News, their morning London TV show. That was the only live report in any media in the West that took place. And frankly, they probably didn't know what they were getting to when, when they put me on the air that morning. But there was no coverage of the truth, and yet they will, you know, just declare, oh, it was a sham election, it's fraudulent, as Yulia said, they're claiming it's an illegitimacy. And yet we now know in the United States, with thousands of dead voters voting for Joe Biden in, in states that had very narrow margins, in the state of Georgia, our Georgia, not the, the one near Russia, in, in the state of Georgia, it's now acknowledged that there were tens of thousands of illegal votes yeah. uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. The Supreme Court there has now ruled that the fact that they uh, that the governor just dictated allowing mail-in ballots w was illegal because it didn't go through the legislative process. And yet they're not reversing the election. They're prosecuting Donald Trump for pointing out what we are now learning, learning was the absolute truth that Joe Biden and the Democrats stole these elections in very small margins. In Arizona, the attorney general who is refusing to acknowledge the truth and the numbers and allow investigations, won her position as attorney general for Arizona by 250 votes, and yet blocked the counting of 9,000 votes from mainly Republican districts that would have cost her her election. It is the fraud, it is the reality of the truth, and yet they're prosecuting Donald Trump for telling the truth, the same way they prosecuted uh, Bolsonaro and have been prosecuting him in Brazil because he didn't do what the establishment, as, as Enrique pointed out, wants to do. And you're not hearing any coverage about President Milieu in Argentina, who has fired bureaucrats, turned their economy around. It is booming way ahead of, of any other country in the world. And yet we're not hearing anything about President Milieu and what I would call the Milieu miracle in Argentina. It is the media, and, and people only know what they know based upon what they're told. Indeed, uh, people know what they know based on what they are told, uh, who reiterate that uh, the media plurality and uh, the uh, availability of the internet has actually helped uh, to uh, bring uh, factual uh, news uh, to uh, to the people. And of course, it has uh, sparked uh, a, a, a critical thinking uh, among uh, eligible voters and people across uh, the global world. In December, perspective for uh, uh, Enrique, we, we are looking at uh, uh, the um, events which have actually uh, affected uh, the uh, the performance or the approval of some top politicians across the globe. And when we listen to the analysis that you, uh, Steve and Yulia, have actual, actually advanced uh, in the course of, of the program where I'm about to uh, ask this question, how have uh, you know uh, these uh, happenings actually uh, discredited uh, uh, leadership and uh, elections, and of course uh, uh, the uh, the process of democracy across the global world? Mm -hmm. And uh, what can be done uh, to to reverse this? And and of course uh, trust mm -hmm. uh, even international uh, bodies that have to do or uh, deal with uh, some of the, the problems uh, affecting the global world at large. Hmm. Well, I can provide uh, two examples. One from Central America, in the form of El Salvador, where happened, uh, where where held elections in uh, February of this year, and uh, the, the incumbent president uh, uh, Najib Bukele won with uh, um, 18, 80, 85 percent of votes. And uh, all the mainstream media, in uh, both in Europe and North America, 
branded this election like uh, he's a di dictator, uh, El Salvador is under dictatorship, Najib Bukele is uh, terrible people, he is tyrant, he is uh, punishing their own people, and so on and so on. And when you look at the alternative media who talk uh, with uh, Salvadorian people, they said, but now we live uh, we live uh, safe. There are security in our country. Uh, we are um, enhancing our economy. We are enjoying our life. Everything goes good, and uh, but people live in jail. So that is the problem. And uh, in the Western countries, they couldn't understand the problems in El Salvador, and they only wanted to brand this uh, victory of Najib Bukele not as uh, a product and outcome outcome of uh, of their own um, policies but no if he won with this difference he is tyrant must be and uh, nothing more and the other example i give you is uh, niger in the sahel region yeah. because when it happened the coup of a date in uh, july of uh, past year in the whole of, uh, for example, the Spanish media, European media, they branded uh, this event like a terrible military coup of a date, and uh, they, they wanted to say that uh, uh, it's a fascist coup of a date, but uh, they, they thought that, uh, okay, but it's in, in Africa, okay, not uh, black fascist. So it, it's terrible, it's part of Russia because Wagner are in the territory, Russia is trying to, to keep uh, uh, Niger and uh, enhancing their own presence. And they were telling a lot of stupid things, but not the reality. What happened? Uh, why it happened this coup of a date in Niger or in Mali before or in Burkina Faso? Because it, uh, it happened to terrible situation. Uh, exploitation in the economic uh, part and uh, the terrible uh, situation about uh, terrorism. So security and economy. When you talk with uh, uh, journalists from Africa, they told you, no, the problem in Sahel territory is uh, security because of terrorism and uh, economy because of uh, post-colonial exploitation. But it, it was like, there is one speech in uh, mainstream media in Europe, and there is another absolutely opposite uh, speech in their uh, local media. It, 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 this is the, uh, absolutely the terrible situation, not because, of course, uh, lying is terrible, but if uh, in mainstream media uh, or, or uh, the establishment, the um, politicians of establishment in Europe, if they are lying and lying and lying, it's not only a problem for, uh, for them, it's a problem for the whole system, because nobody knows what is happening in the reality. So it, it, there is like the real world, the, the global majority in one side, and there is the um, uh, common uh, Western countries in another part living in their own lives, but it's like, no, you, you are going to your own abyss because you are believing your own lies and uh, the, the establishment will fall, but they will drag in their own abyss the, the, the same uh, European and North American people. So it's absolutely terrible for us because we live here and uh, we live under this establishment, this stupid establishment uh, who believes their own lies. So uh, imagine in El Salvador, people is mostly happy with their own president because this president saved them from terrible situation in which El Salvador was known um, in, the, in the whole world uh, because of the um, gangs, the street the gangs, the killings, the murder of people, and security, and so on. And now it's a safe country. And the, what is the problem with it? Or in the case of, of Africa, of Niger, they are trying to fight against the post-colonial exploitation and uh, fighting against terrorism. But uh, this is not in the uh, Western agenda. Because 
because of what? We can talk a lot about this, but yeah. uh, we have these two examples. There is the reality, and you can Mm, mm, you can test, uh, you can find the reality in local media and alternative media in other languages, in all, uh, other countries, but the speech in the uh, European media, mainstream media, was absolutely different from reality. Absolutely. And thank you, of course, uh, talking about uh, 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 the will of uh, the people and trying to uh, relate uh, what is happening right now with what has been uh, happening uh, in the days uh, on uh, the African uh, continent. So we can uh, see uh, that uh, uh, the ideology of uh, Muammar Gaddafi, Thomas Sankara, and other proponents of African unity that advocated for the strong philosophy actually uh, were sidelined. And today, with the reawakening, Africans are aware and, are of course, are wanting uh, to redefine uh, the uh, the history of uh, the continent uh, with uh, total uh, sovereignty. And, uh, of course, uh, this uh, also challenges uh, present leadership and, of course, should we trust uh, uh, leadership and uh, elections and in contemporary uh, society. Uh, looking at uh, the position of uh, uh, Francis uh, Macron, uh, dear Yulia, we are much aware of that uh, uh, the leadership crisis in, uh, in France has uh, given a tough time for Macron and his uh, popularity even in uh, the country. Uh, it's uh, uh, dwindling or declining. And now the question is is uh, uh, how will this affect uh, Macron's position in uh, the uh, forthcoming uh, European uh, Parliament uh, elections? Well, unfortunately, at the moment, even if people do not like him, it's not going to affect his position at all. And even the fact that Macron has uh, done quite a lot of... Um, let's say, not really intelligent things in terms of relations with African leaders and not just that. There are, there are many policies that are, that are uh, quite a mess that he has been implementing. It's not affecting his current role and position. And we've had those uh, discussions recently with the um, experts. And unfortunately, they're saying that people in France at the moment are not uh, what they used to be in terms of their readiness to go out and protest and to express themselves uh, when they don't like what's happening. And I think a huge role was played by the pandemic and all of the uh, pandemic restrictions, especially in Germany, where on the one hand we could see protests of two million people uh, that were going out to say that they do not like the uh, COVID restrictions. And then after a lot of leaders were arrested, after a lot of uh, several rounds of witch hunt, uh, people have just become um, afraid to talk. And I mean, uh, those masks that everyone was putting on their faces that prevented them from expressing themselves uh, have probably also uh, played some kind of a role in terms of muting the people, literally muting the people. And the same situation can be seen in France. The same situation can be seen in Germany, but the hope is for the next round of elections where uh, voters could be playing uh, a greater role if they choose to come and express themselves and exercise their rights. Yet at the same time, we see that the people in, uh, in uh, Europe have become much more passive. You still have some groups like farmers, uh, but they have become passive. And another, another problem is that there is also lack of leadership. Like you had the uh, yellow vests in France, but that was basically just, uh, you know, a group of people that were unhappy for different reasons. There was no manifesto. There was no clear leadership. So the protest was doomed to be just a place to uh, release uh, release uh, that that kind of dissatisfaction. There was no uh, result that it could have achieved because there was no clear position of the group and there were no uh, leaders. On the one hand, it's uh, maybe good, it's the natural flow, but on the other hand, that natural flow leads to nowhere if, uh, uh, if the people do not uh, articulate uh, their demands and if they cannot agree among themselves. And another point I would like to 
uh, briefly make here is that uh, the funny part about elections in non-Western countries, let's put it that way, so everyone else except for the, the uh, United States and European Union or let's say strong countries of the European Union, uh, whenever, let's say right before the election, U.S. ambassadors or ambassadors of uh, European countries come and talk to electoral committees, come and talk to political parties, sometimes oppositional leaders. That is considered to be fine. That is not considered to be interference or, you know, trying to affect the process or the results. Yet at the same time, if you had, uh, let's say, a Chinese ambassador or Russian ambassador actively communicating with the electoral commissions of, uh, you know, some country, that would have been a scandal. And I'm now referring to you know, what's happening in South Africa, South Africa that yeah. is about to enter the election phase uh, uh, this month, actually, right? Yeah. So the U.S. ambassador is actively socializing among uh, uh, the leadership of the Electoral Committee and other actors in the country is fine. And that's what the... Uh, you know, the comments, uh, the, the, the comments that they released uh, were all about that there is nothing, there is nothing, uh, there is nothing about it that could be considered interference. But what are they talking about? I mean, uh, less than a month to the election, what is it they're talking about? And uh, of course, uh, uh, that is a, a very uh, simple but problematic uh, uh, question uh, that, of course, it's actually uh, occupying the political scene in uh, South Africa. Uh, you know, we have a divided opinion as to why the uh, U.S. ambassador had to meet uh, with the uh, uh, South African, uh, uh, the, the head of the Electoral Commission, uh, just a few weeks uh, to the uh, historic uh, uh, elections in the Southern African nation. Uh, we are going to continue. Let me stay with with you, uh, Yulia. Uh, according to some uh, uh, report, uh, the uh, uh, patterning uh, the position of the, the uh, German uh, Chancellor in uh, you know in line with uh, why he had to be one of those uh, uh, top politicians to have uh, uh, recorded uh, really low in uh, uh, this year's rating uh, something that he actually won a lot of uh, confidence of approval in uh, the year 2022 and uh, points like uh, the uh, uh, Apple uh, coalition was and of course uh, the also uh, foreign affairs and the way uh, the chancellor is treating with uh, China and also patterning uh, Germany's uh, position on uh, the uh, Russian energy and uh, the uh, crisis also between uh, the Russian uh, Federation and uh, the uh, government in uh, Kiev. So how can we uh, analyze uh, all of these and how has it affected even uh, the, the the German economy and some of uh, its uh, uh, foreign uh, policy uh, decisions? Well, it's very sad to observe what's happening to Germany, because Germany, once uh, a very strong economically and uh, a strong country in terms of economics, in terms of industrial development, in terms of their um, you know, production capacities and everything, they have lost it all now. I mean, after after the uh, lost the uh, World War II, obviously they uh, uh, they didn't have the the military potential on their own, so they were controlled by uh, first the Soviet Union and uh, the Americans, then just by the Americans with all of the American military bases and the country and all of the uh, military presence over there. But they still had the industry; they still had uh, the top economy in the European Union. And recently, in the last several years, the people were suppressed by the pandemic regulations. All of the activists had to either go to jail or just shut up, basically. Uh, what happened to the economy and to the industry was that um, since they were depending to a large uh, depending to a large extent on the cheap Russian gas, uh, when the Nord Stream two was exploded, they lost that. so they had to move a lot of their uh, production and they had to lose a lot of their industry. But some of the factories, for your information, were moved to Russia 
some of the family businesses were moving to uh, Russia from European countries because they wanted to continue and they wanted to do it in a, uh, a favorable environment. So basically, um, the United States at the moment have full control of uh, Germany because they killed its uh, first uh, spirits and military might, uh, you know, decades ago, and now they killed their economy and killed their um, activists, let's say. So on top of uh, several decades of living with the feeling of guilt, uh, which was uh, uh, which was used for them to uh, to be the main sponsors of the European Union budget, right? Uh, now they have lost pretty much everything and the situation in the economy is quite sad. The situation with their leadership is quite sad and once a great uh, country, they have now become just, uh, you know, uh, people in a very, in a very uh, sad situation. Your meter, please. Uh, I think uh, we, we lost uh, earlier. Uh, coming back to you, uh, Steve Gill, we are looking at uh, uh, some of uh, these uh, indicators of uh, uh, maybe good leadership and, of course, uh, the quality of uh, elections. And if actually elections are a true definition of uh, democracy across the global world. Uh, and with the stakes, uh, as far as the political stakes in contemporary society, in your opinion, what do you think uh, uh, maybe uh, let let, let, let me just say, uh, exploring the concept of real uh, uh, legitimacy in uh, politics, what role do you think uh, aspects like uh, uh, democratic values like uh, transparency and accountability can play in determining uh, the uh, legitimacy of elected officials on a global scale and, of course, uh, a leadership that is intentional about uh, mitigating some of the adverse effects which are uh, of crisis, which are largely uh, uh, man-made. Well, I, I was talking with a friend from Egypt uh, yesterday who was saying that as she talks to folks around the world, uh, they think they ought to be able to vote in, in the U.S. elections because the U.S. president has so much impact on them and the world. If our economy slows down, the rest of the world's economy slows down. And I know we've had you know, some foreign leaders say, well, I, I support Biden being reelected. Uh, that would make sense. And I think Putin has even said that because the perception is, okay, a, a weak American president makes us stronger. But I think they also recognize that in the long run, a strong, capable American president with an economy that's booming that helps carry other economies with it is actually much better. Uh, and, and Biden has been a disaster at home and, and certainly abroad. Uh, I had somebody the other day say, can't you ever say anything pro positive about President Biden. And I said, well, I'm positive he's the worst president we've ever had. Does, does that count? Uh, because he is a disaster, not only for us, but, but for the globe as well. And as we see the continued conflict in Ukraine, uh, this $60 billion that U.S. taxpayers are going to be sending to Zelensky with no accountability, no uh, understanding of where the money that we've sent has gone, where this money will go. When you dig into this $60 billion, uh, some of it's going, billions of it uh, is going to U.S. companies to make more missiles and bombs and, and military equipment that will never go to Ukraine. It's to replenish the U.S. military. So if you've got you know, some Ukrainian soldiers on the front line thinking that all of a sudden ammunition and missiles are on their way, they're wrong. Uh, this is to replenish a lot of the, uh, the resources that American uh, military is looking for and that American companies are looking to produce in key congressional districts where, again, they're going to donate their money to the congressman, they're going to vote for this money because it's putting money into their own pockets and then flowing back to these, uh, these elected officials. I think that when we look at, at, at leadership around the world, the, the question is, are you actually reflecting the interests and values of your people and your country? Uh, you know, the U.S. wants leaders that will do that. But if you have other leaders in other countries that aren't just following, as, as Enrique said, whatever America wants, if they're looking out for the interest of their country, that shouldn't be bad. We shouldn't condemn that. We ought to find a way to work with them 
to make sure that what's in the best interest of their population is also in the best interest of, of our population and, and for the global economy and for global peace. And I think that's where you know, the whole focus of this conversation has been on leadership, that you've got you've to lead with an eye towards what's right, not just what's best right now. And I think we have too many leaders in, in countries all over the world, certainly in the U.S., that are looking to, to next month's polls or next year's election and not looking at the long run of what is in the best interest of establishing relationships with other countries, relationships with other world leaders that can, that can bring people together rather than push them apart. To, to me, the worst part of our foreign policy right now with the U.S. and Russia is that we are pushing Russia away from us towards China, towards um, those in, in the Middle East that are our enemies, rather than finding a way to, to relate with each other, to communicate with each other, to deal with each other in a positive way. Uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times, I was in Russia last September, I was in Russia in, in March. Even though the U.S. media and our leaders are demonizing Russia, President Putin, and the Russian people, the, the Russian people love Americans. I, I didn't deal with anybody that was not completely hospitable and friendly and wanting to know more about America and wanting to embrace Americans. And, and despite the demonization that our country and, and government have been involved in, there is not an animosity from Russia to America. Uh, and yet most Americans have no clue about the reality of Russia. And when somebody like me or when Tucker Carlson goes there and tells the truth, you know, we get condemned. We, we get treated as pariahs, as, as traitors, when the reality is we're just looking and seeing it for ourselves, talking to people, telling the truth, which should be what journalists and, and what leaders in our country should be seeking. We keep having members of Congress go meet with Zelensky and, and pat him on the back while he, again, cancels elections, cancels opposition political parties, cancels uh, independent media, attacks the Russian Orthodox Church. They embrace that. And yet they're not going to Russia, meeting with Russian leaders to say, how do we, how do we resolve this? How do, we, how do we get back together? How do we find a, a resolution that moves us forward? Yuli and I have, have talked that there is going to be an after, that this conflict in Ukraine is going to end, maybe sooner rather than later. Yeah. There will be more bodies lost on, on both sides, but it will end. What's the after? What, what's the process and who are the people thinking now? Where do we go after? To, to restore relationships with, with Russia, to restore relationships with Russian businesses, to restore the credibility that the U.S. has when we're interfering with elections, when we're you know, seeking to jail the, the top presidential candidate in this country with a, a corrupt Department of Justice and FBI and Biden administration. How do we tell the rest of the world how to behave when they're seeing how our administration is behaving? We're losing our credibility. We're losing that leadership that we're talking about, Clarice, and, and restoring it will be very, very difficult. And it will just not just be difficult for the U.S., it's going to be difficult for the world because we have to lead. We have to play an important role in, in making the world economy work and making the world more peaceful. And we are abdicating that responsibility right now. And it, and it is tragic and it is shameful. Indeed, uh, very shameful, uh, but uh, with the new world order, uh, it is imperative uh, to redefine our narratives on how the, uh, we can uh, shape the world, like you've said. What happens uh, is uh, the, the fighting in the world just to see uh, politicians uh, get themselves to the top, and of course we forget about uh, the people who voted us uh, into office. And uh, this brings us to this uh, question, uh, uh, Enrique, you know, I, I want us to, to look at this uh, very important uh, uh, example. Here we are looking at uh, what uh, uh, factors or indicators can determine uh, a legitimate uh, leadership. Uh, you bear with me uh, recently uh, uh, the leadership of uh, Ukraine, uh, Zelensky, uh, again, uh, categorically is said that uh, 
the intention mm. to, to join in NATO uh, will only be uh, fruitful if uh, Ukraine can defeat Russia. And uh, this was reiterated with uh, the visit of uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the NATO uh, chief uh, in uh, Kiev. So the question is, how can we um, use uh, maybe uh, uh, new tenets of international relations, which the global world wants to define mm. under this uh, new world order, especially in the political uh, uh, dimension of it, to redefine a perspective and of course, uh, to, to maybe uh, uh, change the, the, the scale of, of preference, like from uh, maybe a leaders at the top and given uh, the, the citizens or the population, uh, the, 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 the major pop, uh, uh, position, so that uh, when taking political decisions, especially as far as uh, geopolitical decisions are concerned, we will put the interest of the people first to be able to ensure a total a world that will uh, maybe benefit from a global peace and serenity that will make us also enjoy economic buoyancy and uh, maybe enjoy also the endowment of the world. Hmm. Well, the most important now is that the it doesn't matter if in Ukraine there are elections or not because they are in the good side, you can understand, they are part of uh, Western world or they have a pro-Western country. So no matter what they what they do, everything is uh, reasonably. So if there are no elections in Ukraine, no problems. They are our proxy, the Western proxy. So no problem with it. And also, the main problem now in the conflict in Ukraine is not uh, only Ukraine, it's the attempt uh, to extend the, the war in other parts of Europe by the same European Union. It's the most stupid thing. Uh, usually, if you are talking about the uh, European Union, the word stupid or foolishness appears a lot because they are usually make uh, this, uh, they, they are act in that way. They are promoting uh, extending war in, uh, especially in the case of uh, Moldova, Romania, Poland, uh, Baltic uh, countries, Finland, and they are pushing this uh, uh, attempt of uh, changing regime in uh, Georgia, in Georgia, not uh, state of USA, but Georgia in the, Kafkas, in the in the Caucasus, this country, because um, imagine the, the situation. They want to follow the old uh, um, geopolitical theory about the, content, the contention against Russia in Europe, in Caucasus, uh, creating a lot of conflicts, um, like a serpent of uh, fighting conflicts to separate Europe and Russia. This is understandable for a, a British or a North American position, but this is absolutely stupid if the mo most uh, collaborators in this case are the same European countries, the continental European countries, because they are uh, the uh, actors and the victims of this conflict, of this extending conflict. And, uh, for example, in the case of uh, Moldova, it, in uh, our media is uh, talked about uh, the conflict in the Transnistria, Pridnestrovia, and uh, this will drag uh, Moldova in a war, and this means uh, the dragging of Romania, and Romania is NATO state, so what will happen? NATO will, will, uh, will be at war against Russia. Uh, that's the excuse, that's the reason, the lure of the war. Okay, uh, we don't know, but uh, it uh, it appears that uh, this is the way, because our politicians are promising uh, war in the borders, in the eastern borders, and they are promising decreasing of uh, society, of salaries, of uh, social service, of everything, and the shortage, shortage of uh, water, electricity, resources, food, and so on, because climate change, or uh, it doesn't matter the new excuse that uh, they will invent this year or, or next year, or so on. And uh, 
of course, people hate the oligarchical class, political class in Europe, and that's the way they are unlegitimate to to rule. And that's the way the most voted party is the abstention, is the non-voters. Uh, it's uh, it it started uh, some decades ago like a joke, but now it's a terrible reality because the uh, most of people don't vote because they are not represented by the system. And but of course they absolutely ignore when it's about uh, Western countries. If uh, this happened in um, third world country, okay, and especially in an opposite country, in a, uh, for example, in Russia, China, Iran, Venezuela, Syria, or uh, some country very opposite uh, against uh, Western uh, globalism. Then they will remark that abstention is the most voted party in that country. The system is not uh, legitimate. And uh, the, in the case of uh, legitimation, it's very interesting because when it's about uh, color revolution, is the first issue on the table. I mean, uh, they said, uh, no, this government is not legitimate. Uh, we have uh, one hundred or one thousand uh, demonstrator, demonstrators in the streets. So uh, this means that uh, this uh, terrible regime will be uh, falling and uh, the Western democracy will be here, especially in the case of Georgia and Georgia in the Caucasus, because they are trying to uh, throw away a government which uh, wants to uh, find out who is a foreign uh, agency, a foreign uh, uh, element. And uh, in Western media, they are telling that this is a copy of uh, Russian law, but they are uh, forgetting that uh, USA has the same law from 1938. So almost one century ago, uh, especially United States established this um, uh, foreign uh, uh, agents uh, service act, or more in uh, in abbreviatory is uh, FARA, and it's very interesting. And I finish with this because of course we, we are going when, to visit when, uh, subsequently the program to talk more about. Uh, I, I think uh, let's just conclude with you, uh, Yulia, looking at uh, the uh, how countries can address the challenges of leadership legitimacy and public trust in the face of complex uh, geopolitical dynamics and shifting uh, power dynamics. Just one minute, please. Uh, well, I think that leadership grows bottom up because only a person that has gone all the way from the bottom to the top knows what being a leader is because that path itself requires a lot of skills starting from uh, having a character and a certain charisma, willpower, being a role model, going through all the steps, getting into all of the details. Um, and everything else. So um, climbing to the top from the very bottom makes a person a real leader because the ones that get uh, leadership inherited from their, you know, uh, families or um, from their allied groups or whatever else, we have already seen enough of fruits uh, of the kind, right? When those people uh, just get uh, the power because they belong to a certain clique. And that creates a lot of deformations and that creates a lot of deformations in the policies that they provide because they uh, just do not have the, the relevant background and experience to really understand what people's problems are about. So. The leadership grows from the bottom to top, uh, real leadership that is based on, uh, you know, hard and soft skills necessary for that. That's point number one. Number two, I suppose that uh, the political systems will be changing a lot and the electoral procedures as well, because now we have a lot more equipment available. We have uh, uh, possibilities to use uh, webcams at the polling stations, analyze what's happening there. We have the possibilities of digital voting and uh, a lot more. 
So the process itself becomes uh, different. And there are already quite a lot of uh, platforms that were elaborated to make voting easier, even uh, not just for, uh, let's say, uh, representatives or parliamentarians, but also to have direct vote on topical issues of okay. local level at the moment. So this is all possible. I think this will be developing with the AI and big data, big data analysis. There are a lot more options to implement that kind of systems, but the problem with those would be possible manipulations and fraud within those. But that's another issue to deal with. So leadership grows uh, from bottom to top, and then it becomes real, and then it's supported by the people, and that's the real legitimacy. It's not numbers, it's not statements, but it's uh, if the leader actually does have support of the people or not. Indeed, of course, uh, it's about leadership uh, that is uh, people-oriented. Uh, thank you so much, uh, gentlemen and lady, for the great insight on our topic for discussion uh, this day, and also appreciating our uh, uh, millions of viewers who have uh, uh, chosen uh, the Pan-African uh, television, thanking as well the Technica crew for ensuring a smooth run of the program. Uh, this is not all. Keep having a lovely moment in the company of programs on For You Media Africa, always remember that it is another view of the world.